Amen. Thank you, Odain. Kids, I do need you to be in here for a second. I, we're going to talk about a story about a storm, and I want you to help me um, in kind of recreate a storm here in our sanctuary. But first, I just want to read the story to you. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4, and I've got the text up there. We're going to talk about Jesus calm in the storm, and I'm going to read the story to you. And then with your help, we are going to recreate a storm in this in this place, okay? So let's read Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35 to 41. It says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him too. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and, and said to him, Teacher, do you, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and, and, and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? So we're going to create a storm and we're going to build it up. And then just like Jesus said, you know, calm down, we're going to bring it back down. So I I need your help. So I need all the kids and all the big kids too, all the adults. Um, You're going to do this with me. But we're going to start by creating some sound effects for a storm. But it's going to start really soft and then get more intense. So I just want you to watch me and follow what I'm doing, okay? So let's start with this. Oh, come on. Even big kids. Let's go, everybody, adults. Oh, now more intense. I love that. We just made a storm appear and go away right here. Kids, you are dismissed. Thank you for your help. We needed that visual, yeah? Thank you so much. You're dismissed to your classes. Guys, you know, storms are all over the Bible. There's so many of them. Um, There's actually 37 different times in the Bible where there's like a storm mentioned. And it's something that seems to be a constant theme. And so we're going to read the story one more time. I'm going to read it to you. And then we're going to talk about this particular story. And I just wanted to say before we started, you know, we're going to read a narrative, and I was thinking about this. What if I was a person without a Christian background, and I walked into a church, and they read a story about a man's life, and then expected me to apply those principles into my life? I just want to say that if you're not a Christian, if you, if you don't have a Christian background, that might sound a little bit weird. Like, they, people don't usually do that with historical stories. They don't read a story about Abraham Lincoln and, and, and find all the ways they can you know, take the principles and, and apply it into their lives. It's something that we do uniquely as Christians, but it's something that we do very intentionally because, you know, the stories that we read about Jesus aren't just stories in history. He's modeling his life to us. And Jesus in this story, and, and the reason it's told to, for, to us is so that we would learn about how he operates, how we operate, and then we would apply those things into our lives. And so we're going to look at this story and learn how is Jesus conducting himself here? How are the disciples conducting themselves here? What's the point? Why, why would the Holy Spirit make sure that this story remained in Scripture? How would it speak to us today? So we're going to read it again, and then I'm going to talk about some themes that are there, okay? So Mark 4, 35, it says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him. They they took with them. uh, Let me start again. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? 
have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Um, to tell you the truth, this story is all about a five-letter word that doesn't even appear in the story. Could you show that next slide? Really, the theme of this story is one five-letter word. And I'm going to tell you what that word is later. Um, I don't want to tell you just yet, but you're going to figure it out quickly. This story is about a five-letter word. And, and it's the heart of this story, but it's not mentioned specifically in there. And so what I do want to do is go through this story and, and talk to you about three elements that are there that, that are pretty obvious. One is we're going to talk about the storm itself. We're going to talk about the promise. And we're going to talk about the questions that were asked. And we're going to look at those three things, the storm, the promise, and the questions. And through those three things, we're going to discover what the heart of the story really is. And I'll share with you that five-letter word. So let's start with a storm. You know, some versions say that uh, the storm was a squall. And I, and I kind of Googled, like, what, what is a squall? I had no idea what a squall was. So I found a picture that came out. And a squall is also known as, like, a microburst. And doesn't this look insane? Doesn't this look like a, a nuclear bomb going off? But it's actually not. It, it is just a, a, a micro storm. And a squall is like a powerful, localized storm that's often accompanied by high winds or rain or sleet or snow. But it is just an intense local storm. And, and that's, how'd you feel being under that? Yeah? And imagine being under that, but in a boat in the sea. Oh, whoa, what a, a picture that is. And, and listen, there are lots of storms in the Bible. I already told you 37 times there are stories about storms in the Bible. And, and why do you think that is? Why, why do you think there are so many stories about storms. When, when God wants to depict something kind of scary, why do you think he picked storms? Uh, and, and listen, I'm literally asking, so give me some, some feedback. Why do you think? Because you can't control it. And they're, they're a bit scary. And for the time, I think they really did represent things that were kind of uncontrollable, the things that were a little bit scary, things that were that are outside of our, our power. And you got to remember that the Back then, the, the disciples were fishermen, so storms were a part of life, and then they were scary, and they affected business, and they affected livelihood, and, and this is an agrarian society. Storms affected your life. It was more than just storms where, like, our school might be delayed for an hour or something like that. It, it, it really affected their, their life, and, and it represented something that they were scared of because it was out of their control. But I want to ask you today, like, uh, if this, these stories were written today, maybe they wouldn't have so many storm stories. What are the things that affect us, that feel out of control for us? I mean, the, one of the big fears in their life were, were, were storms uh, and floods and, and these kinds of things in their society. What are the things that, you know, God would write stories about in the Word for us? What are the things that we fear? Again, I'm asking you. What are the things that feel out of control for you sometimes that kind of freak you out. Traffic. <laughs> Sometimes those things can feel, oh, so out of control. That, that's right. Or, you know, a lack of a Wi-Fi. You know, that, that could be like, oh, my gosh, that's our big storm, right? Uh, what are we going to do? Yeah, what do you think, Gavin? Getting lost. Wow, what a great answer for a child. Yeah. What else? What are some of these storms that that maybe that we face, that, that are come into our life and feel so uncontrollable that, and they make us nervous. What's that? Finances. Yeah, you know, there was, no, um, there was no stock market or 401K for God to write about, but these are the things that kind of make our stomach churn when our retirement's not doing so well, when our, our bills are coming due. This is not something that he could have written about uh, back then, but those are things that, that do affect us. That's right, wh whether it's health issues, or financial crisis, or, or relational crisis, or work crisis. I mean, there's no shortage of crisis today. Maybe our number one fear is not storms and floods anymore, but there's no shortage of things that feel out of our control and things that freak us out, things that keep us up at night, even today. And honestly, I want to tell you that in this story, any one of those things can be represented by the storm. And you could swap out the storm 
for, for something like a bankruptcy or, or, or the loss of a loved one or loss of a relationship. And the formula of the story would work the same, okay? So don't, don't get stuck on the fact that we just don't have very many of these here in Toronto. Any of these storms that we feel in our life would make the story work the same. The storm can be whatever wrecks you. And maybe the intensity of your storm right now is just, you know, this level. Not so bad. Maybe the storm that you're going through right now is more this level. Or maybe it's at full stomp right now and you just feel like, I have no idea what's going on or what's coming next. But this storm is tough and intense and I I don't know that where you are right now, what your storms are. Maybe a few of you, I know that, but, uh, you know, whatever storm you're going through, at whatever intensity level, this story is for you. And I want to ask you, what's stressing you out? What is wrecking you right now? What is your storm? And I want you to think about it, please. And let's pray about it. Father God, I know that um, in this room right now, there are people with unique stories um, and, and unique experiences in life, but that also means that sometimes we have very unique storms, and, and they have very common themes in them, but Lord, um, there are things that each one of us are going through that maybe only you and them know about, and for some of us, Lord, it's very intense right now, and for some of us, it's just ramping up, and Father God, I ask you to teach us today Um, how we should be in the storm when you are in the storm with us. Um, Father God, would you teach us today through this story? In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to talk about the storm. I told you three things. First, the storm. What was the second thing I told you we were going to talk about? Do you remember? The promise. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the promise. And and listen, we're going to look at the promise in this story. And and I want you to go back to the text if you can, Um, just put the text back up there. And, and you're going to have to look hard for this promise because it, it's kind of like an implied promise. There is no statement here that says, I promise to. But there is a promise in this story. And I'll give you a hint. It's early on in the story, even in the first verse. Someone raise your hand when you think that you have it. You, you know what the promise is. Raise your hand if you know here what the implied promise is, okay? Yeah, a few of you. What's the promise in the story? I'll let you answer. What, 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 what was Im- the implied promise? He was with them. That's right. In verse 35, it says, let's go to the other side. That's what Jesus says. He tells everybody listening, if you follow me, we're going to get to the other side. Whoever's with me, whoever gets in that boat, we're going to get to that other side. Let's Go across to the other side is the exact promise, and it's implied. And and listen, from the beginning, Jesus lets them know that what their destination is. He says, look, I've already got in mind where we're going, and I want you to follow me. I'm revealing my plan to you. I want to get you to the other side, and anyone who's following me, we're going to the other side. And listen, there's some things that I've learned about the promises of Jesus, and uh, some of them are implied and some of them are overt, and I just want to I want to share with you a few of the promises that I've learned from Jesus for those who follow him. Um, These are some of his anyone who follows me promises that Jesus gives to us. Here's a a few of them. First of all, Jesus promises his forgiveness to those who follow him. He promises his healing. He promises reconciliation. He promises restoration. And maybe most importantly, he promises healing himself, what you're saying, his presence to anyone who follows him. And listen, understand how these promises work. Like, you know, he he promises the forgiveness of sins when we trust him, uh, when we realize that he died on the cross for our sins, and and he promises healing, and, and that doesn't mean we don't get sick as follower of Jesus, but it does mean that ultimately, whether in this life or the next, he will bring his healing, that pain will not go on forever. He offers reconciliation between us and God and with each other. And he offers restoration, and of course, he promises himself. He promised all those things if we'll put our faith in his life, death, and resurrection and follow him. Now, 
Here's another thing I've learned about the promises of Jesus. Here it is. I think it's the next slide. Believing the promises of Jesus means leaving other promises behind. If you're going to follow Jesus and believe his promises, you've you got to leave some of the other promises of, of the world behind there, because there are lots of other promises out there in life. There's a lot of promises that our culture tries to instill in our, our mind, and sometimes we inherit these promises from our parents. Sometimes they're the product of, of our own like self-deception or self-destruction. But listen, there's a lot of other promises out there, and if you're going to follow if you're going to believe the promises of Jesus, you have to leave some of these other promises behind. Let me give you an example of one. It's a common one, right? If you just keep your head down and work hard, good things will happen to you. That's part of the Protestant work ethic, right? Just keep your head down, work hard, mind your business, uh, and things will work out for you. Here's another one. If you just do more harm, I mean, if you just do more good than harm in the end then that's enough for God. You and God are straight. If you just do more good than harm, you and God are fine. Here's another promise. If you just follow your gut and stay true to yourself, then that's enough. That, that's all you really have to do. That's all that matters. And listen, these are promises, again, that we inherit from culture. Sometimes they're passed down to us from our parents. Sometimes, again, they're the product of our own sinful nature. But they are false promises because we know that they actually don't work out the way that they promise. And listen, in verse 36 of this story, there's a description, a literal description of them climbing into the boat, and it says that they left the crowd behind. And, and it's a perfect picture of if we're going to believe the promises of Jesus, there has to be this act where we climb into the boat with him and we leave those other promises from the crowd behind. Believing the promises of Jesus means climbing into his boat and leaving those behind. Now, how do you do this? How do you actually physically turn away from the promises of this world and start trusting in the promises of Jesus? Well, the, the Bible uses the word repentance, which means to turn away from. It's literally what it means. It means to turn away from something. And, and repentance isn't just repenting from sin or destructive behaviors. It also means that we repent from faith in bad promises. And listen, you become a follower of Jesus. You become a Christian when you repent and believe, when you turn away from your sin, but also from faith in bad promises. And you start trusting the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as God's plan to reconcile you to him. You become a Christian when you repent of that. But after you become a Christian, you, you need to know the, the work's not really done. You still need to be repenting of these promises from the world that creep back into our lives. Because, you know, even though you may love and follow Jesus, maybe you've mixed in some of those bad promises with what, some of God's promises. And, and you've created this weird kind of hybrid of how you live your life. You, you, you've tried to combine the two of saying, you know, I can follow Jesus and still believe some of the promises of the world. We have a tendency to do that. Oh, that's just the way we are. I was telling Dirk that I, I'm from Argentina, and we are obsessed with soccer in Argentina. Most of you know that. We, we're obsessed with soccer. In fact, um, there's a funny sport in Argentina called pato. Does anybody know what the, the game, the sport pato is? Well, someone introduced polo to Argentina after they were already addicted in love with soccer, and this was kind of the result. Now, if you read the Wikipedia thing, it says pato is, is a combination of polo and basketball. Trust me, it's not a combination of polo and basketball. It's just like we didn't know how to combine it with soccer, and there, we, you know, we don't have long enough legs to kick it from the horse, so you know, they, they created this soccer ball. You could see it right there in the bottom right corner with handles that people pick up from the ground and throw into the net. And it's, it's just like you know, in Argentina, they're like, yeah, I love your polo game, but we really love soccer, so this is how we're going to play it. And they created this insane mashup. And look, the, the next picture is the same. This is Brazilians, just as nutty. They, they took volleyball, and they said, yeah, but we really like soccer, so we're going to create foot volley. And, and, it's, and it's an insane sport. 
And listen, um, I think that's how we are with a lot of things. See, we're in love with certain things, and, and then when something new is introduced into our life, we say, well, why can't I have both? Why can't I just combine them together? And that could work with sports, but it can't work with our faith. Some of the promises that we grew up with of this world, these false promises that we just mentioned, are so ingrained in us, they're so a part of us that when we meet Jesus and we hear his message, we say, yes, I want that in my life, but at the same time, I don't want to let go of something that's always been like my security blanket, my way of thinking all of my life. So we create these hybrids of faith that Jesus says doesn't work. They don't work. You know, in reference to money, Jesus says you cannot serve two masters. That could be in reference to anything. We are not allowed two masters. We're not allowed to believe two sets of conflicting promises. There's a moment in our life when we become Christians where we have to say, I want to leave the promises of the world behind. And I'm going to trust in what Jesus promises. And then after we become Christians, there's a continual maintenance of not letting those old promises back in. That's really important. Please remove his picture. I don't want you to see that guy's business <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> Sorry, I should have found a most, more modest picture there. Let's get back to your storm real quick. Let's get back to, to what you're going through. Jesus promised to you is that if, if you're in the boat with him, if, if you're following him, whatever storm that you're going through right now, if you're following him, you're going to get to the other side of that storm, Th- that financial storm, that health storm, that relational storm, that parental storm, whatever it is, Jesus is going to get you to the other side of that storm. And in Jesus, you can have confidence that no storm will define you and no storm will end you. Your relationship with Jesus will define you, and it will sustain you. And listen, his presence in our life and following his promises doesn't mean the storms don't come. They come. It just means he's going to be there with us and walk us to the other side of that storm hand in hand. And this is an amazing, amazing part of our faith that that Jesus not only promises to get us to the other side of our storm, but he promises to be there with us in our storm. With every wave of anxiety that crashes over into your life, Jesus is there. He is there. That's his promise. Um, I have a picture of a bike here that is really old, uh, and this was not my bike. I did not have a leopard seat bike. Uh, Actually, this is a same model as my bike, except mine was much cooler. It was all purple um, with a purple seat. And, and this is the, the bike I had when I was a kid, or same model at least. And um, I, I just wanted to show this to you. It's important because there was this really cool piece here, uh, this little handle in the back that really helped my learning how to ride a bike. Because what my dad would do, who was a pastor, and he was still a pastor when you had to go to like an office every day and wear a suit and tie and everything. And he'd come home and He'd take off his tie, but in his, you know, buttoned-up shirt, and it was Houston, so it was hot, so, you know, this short sleeve buttoned-up shirt and his dress pants, he would go out there and teach me how to ride a bike. And, and so listen, not until I was a dad did I realize how much work that really is, because it just sounds fun to teach a kid to ride a bike, but when you've been working all day, man, one of the last things you want to do is get out there in the Houston heat and just help someone ride a bike. But he did it joyfully, because he loved me. And teaching me how to ride a bike, he, he kind of would... Uh, tell me, like, okay, Seba, you need to start pedaling, and um, you need to go, you know, brilliant advice, start pedaling and go, Uh, but he would run right behind me and hold on to that handle right there in the seat. Do you see it right there? He would would hold me straight until we got a decent amount of speed going. Once you get a decent amount of speed going, what happens? Just, you know, the, the, the forces, physics takes over, and you can just start going straight. And there was this moment where I was like, let go, Dad. And, and he let go, and, and, man, I was just going on my own. I felt so amazing. But then, you know, being awkward and not knowing how to pedal just right just yet, like uh, what happens with your bike when you start slowing down? Oh, yeah. You know, with those big old handlebars and start shaking every direction and you start panicking a little bit. And I remember, I, you know, in that moment of panic, which, you know, as, you know, I don't remember even how old I was. I was sure I was going to die. These were my last moments on earth. And so I just screamed out to my dad, Poppy, Poppy. And, and, and immediately 
the bike just straightened up. And I was like, wow, what a miracle. It was like, I, I, I must be a better rider than I thought. And then, and then I, I, I didn't realize in that moment that, that I could still hear my dad. And I turned around, and he was there holding the seat steady. And, and what I didn't know until later was, when I thought about it, is that, you know, he never stopped running behind me. Even when he let me go and let me experience some of that freedom on my own, he never stopped running with me. And the moment I called his name, he grabbed onto that bike and he straightened me up. What a beautiful image that is of a loving father, right? And it doesn't even compare to the image of God running with us through the storm. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, however you're starting to wobble right now, God is running right there with you. Jesus is with you. And he's got the hand, his hand on your life. What an amazing, amazing gift that is, his, his presence. So I told you three things that we were going to talk about today were going to be the, the storm, the promise, and what was the last thing we were going to talk about? Do you remember? The questions, that's right. Before we get to the questions, let's deal with the oddest detail in the story, okay? This is the one that maybe you're thinking you should have led with this one, but this is just a very odd detail. It says, the, the story doesn't say that when the storm was going on, that Jesus was just relaxed, or he was, you know, not worried. What does it say about Jesus? What is he doing during the storm? He is asleep, and, and Dirk and I were talking about this, like, how is he sleeping in this kind of microburst that I just showed you a picture of? How in the world is he sleeping when my wife can't even sleep through my snoring? Like, Jesus is asleep in this kind of storm. How, how is that possible? And, and listen, the only way I can explain it is that Jesus believed his own promise enough that the storm didn't freak him out. He believed in his own promises enough that nothing was going to freak him out. And while everyone else was panicking, Jesus was, was resting on the strength of his promise. He knew he was going to get to the other side. You know, I, I love watching, I took Elias to watch a movie yesterday. I love watching movies with my son Elias because especially even a year ago or so, he was so expressive when he was watching a movie. I remember watching E.T. with him. And every time there was a tense moment in E.T., he, I mean, he'd, he'd literally start backing up a little bit. Or, or you know, I could see his, his, his toes, like, start curling when he's a little bit nervous, and he gets a little bit tense in a tense part of the movie. And, 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 and you know, I remember in climactic scenes, he, he, he would get up and start backing up from the TV, and, and he he turned and, and, and looked at me, and, and he saw that I was completely relaxed. Why was I relaxed? Because I've seen it. I know that when E.T. and Elliot are on the bike and they're about to get busted by police, that the bike takes off and flies. I know that already. Spoiler alert. Sorry if you haven't seen it. I know that E.T. makes it home and that they don't capture him. Again, sorry if you haven't seen it yet. I, I, I know. I've seen the movie, so he looks at me, and I'm totally relaxed. He looks at his mom. I'm, he, Aaron's completely asleep, like every movie, 15 minutes in. She's totally sleeping. And I can see it in his mind processing, how are you so relaxed? And, and in my head, I'm just thinking, son, I already know how the story ends. Jesus was asleep on the boat, and he's relaxed because he's resting on his promises, and he knows how this story ends already. And listen, that needs to, to be a comfort to you. But it wasn't. It wasn't to the disciples. Actually, it, it, it got them mad. This, this sleeping Jesus, instead of taking a cue from him and saying, well, if he's okay, I must be okay. If he's not worried, I don't need to worry. It, it was exactly the opposite reaction. It inflamed their, mm, their anger even more. Because it's a very human thing that when you're freaking out, you want other people to freak out too, Right? Josh and Jess are just moving, newlyweds, just moving. And, and I was asking Josh, how's it going? He says, yeah, it's pretty good. How's the move? You stressed about it? No, no. I was like, how's Jess? Well, a little more stressed than me. And I gave him some unsolicited advice. I said, listen, um, it, next time she acts stressed about the move, you act just as stressed as her, okay? Don't, don't tell her to calm down. Don't tell her, you know, we got this. 
just kind of be like, yeah, me too. I'm, you know, because early on in that relationship, you know, you, you, one of the most natural things in the world is that when you're going through something and you're freaking out, you want other people, you, you look for them to have the same reactions because they validate like, yes, this is important. I get it. I, I, I'm seeing this properly. I'm taking this as seriously as you are. That's the message that they need, right? And so let's look at these questions that they ask. Let's end by looking at these questions. And, and there's three sets of questions. And, and, and the first two are actually not even questions. They're more like accusations. Uh, they're, they're like dueling questions um, in, in which the disciples and Jesus have a little bit of a flare-up in their relationship. And, and the first question there is that they, they wake up Jesus and ask um, Right there, underline. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? This is not a question. This is a statement. They're saying, don't you care that we're about to die? Aren't, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus wakes up and surprises everybody by stopping the storm supernaturally. And then he asks this to his disciples. He says, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Again, he's not asking questions. He's making an accusation there too. These are, these are dueling questions that are kind of dressed like questions, but they're more statements that they're making to each other. Uh, what the disciples were really saying to Jesus was, you're not taking this storm seriously enough, Jesus. You're not taking this storm seriously. And Jesus stops the storm and comes back at them saying, you're not taking my promises seriously enough. You're not taking my power seriously enough. You're not taking my presence seriously enough. You're, you're not taking me seriously enough. So these dueling questions were, were really just statements in which the disciples are saying, you're not taking this seriously. And Jesus comes back to them and says, you're not taking me seriously. Because you wouldn't act that way if you were. And then... You know, that's, that's a very normal reaction from the disciples, but it is a correct reaction also from Jesus. And there it is. This is really the apex of the story. This story is all about trust. There's your five-letter word. This story is about trust. The storm drove them to not trust Jesus, and Jesus called them out on their lack of trust. And listen, I'm, I want to tell you something. I think it's very possible to both take the storm seriously and the promises of Jesus seriously. I think you could do both. I think you can recognize a storm as something that's very threatening in your life, whatever it is, whether it's a health problem or a Relational problem, marital problem, parental problem, vocational problem. I think it's possible to take that storm very seriously and also take the promises of Jesus very seriously. But what you can't do, what you can't do is you can't focus on both. Your heart cannot focus on both. Your heart has to choose one. Your heart has to choose one that it will focus on because your heart will either focus on the storm or it will trust the promises, but it will not do both. Only one of them is going to tuck you into bed at night. Only one of them is going to be the last thing you think about. And it's either your storm or it's either the promises of Jesus. And you can usually tell if you're focused on the storm. You can usually tell if you're more focused on the storm than Jesus by the way that you treat the loving people around you. Just like the disciples lashed out to the person who was leading and loving them the most and said, don't you care? That's how we react when we're focused on the storm to loved ones around us. You can, you can tell what you're focusing on. It, it changes your character. And of course, as Christians, why would we focus on the storm when we have Jesus right there with us? So how do you stop focusing on the storm? And how do you start trusting the promises of Jesus? So I'm going to show you three things that you need to be doing. Here's how you do that. Here's how you take the focus off the storm and onto the promises. First, you need to learn the promises of God. You need to know about these promises that Jesus makes. You, you need to know how our value and our worth is attached to him and not any end result of any storm. 
You need to know that. And listen, if you, I hope that you get to hear that when you come on Sunday morning, but you need more than an hour on Sunday. You need to be reading those promises yourself. You need to be finding them in your small groups. You need to be in a discipleship relationship where someone is constantly giving you the promises of Jesus, the promises of God into your life and teaching you what those promises are. The second thing that you need to know is you need to get to know the promise maker. You know, your time with the Lord, your time spent in, in the word of God is not just to get to know the Bible. It's to get to know the creator. Your intimacy needs to grow. You need to learn to talk to him in those storms like he is there and listening like he's right there. And listen, lastly, you need to be around promise people. You need to be around people who believe the promises of Jesus. And, and I'm not just talking about people who are constantly giving you happy talk. I cannot stand happy talk. You know, when things are bad, they're bad. And if someone's just giving you happy talk because it makes them feel better, I think it's disingenuous. And I'm not talking about that. And Christians don't walk around just happy talking one another. I mean, we know that there are real storms in life, but we also know that in those storms, we're, we're choosing to trust God more than the fake promises of this world. You need to be around people who are doing that in their life, people who you see doing that. Be around them. It is contagious, this trust in Jesus. When your heart focuses on the promise of God, you start to gain the ability to rest in him instead of constantly resting, wrestling with the storm. You need to rest in him, not wrestle your storm. So here, in conclusion, we're just going to end with the last question that was on the text. Could you put the text back up there? I just want you to see that, that last question that was asked. The story ends with the disciples asking one more question, and this one was a real question. It wasn't, they just said, who is, who is this that even the storms, the winds, the seas, they obey him? Who is this man? And I want to ask you that question. I want you to think about your storm. You got it locked in. You know what's, what's stressing you out. Now I want you to think about this. Who is Jesus to you? Is he a historical figure? Is he the founder historically of your faith and that's merely it? Or is he someone who during your storm holds your hand and is there with you? Is he someone whose promises you are believing in? Are, are you clinging, clinging on to those promises during your storm? Is he someone that you're trusting your life with? Let's do one more thing, and then we're done. Okay, you're about to have surgery, a very complicated surgery. You're in a room by yourself, and it's a complicated, serious surgery. Uh, and again, you're in the room waiting to go into the surgery by yourself. Give me a level of stress that you're feeling right now. Above your head is, is I'm, I'm really stressed out. Down here is really low stress. So physically show me right now with your hands. Go ahead. High stress or low stress, show me, show me the level. Go ahead and keep it up, keep it up, yeah, go ahead. Okay, keep it up there. Some of you are, are freakishly low and some of you are pretty high, very good. Okay, now keep it up there. In walks the foremost expert in that surgery in the world, never lost a patient, never had a failure, and he walks into the room and says, I'll be conducting your surgery today. Now, show me where your stress is now, show me. And then in walks the person that loves you the most and grabs your other hand and says, I'm going to be with you, and I'll be here when you get out, and I love you, and things are going to be okay. Show me your stress level. Dramatically different. In Jesus Christ, we have both the number one storm stopper of all time, the one who can cut, bring us through any storm, and the person who loves you more than anybody. And that presence should matter. And just like you went from here to here, I think you could do that today spiritually from whatever storm you're going through. You can go from here to here just knowing that Jesus is holding your hand right now. And he can walk you through any storm. And he loves you more than anybody. You just have to start believing his promises. Let's pray. And I'm going to pray for you this way. I'm going to pray that uh, there's some of you who may be wanting to trust Jesus for the first time. You've never trusted him before. You're, you're entrenched in the promises of this world, and you want to start, Jesus, start trusting Jesus instead. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for those of you who need to start trusting Jesus again. 
you've let the promises creep back in and, and you've not been trusting him. I want to pray for you. I want to, I want to pray for those of you who need to feel his presence right now because you're going through a pretty bad storm. And I want to pray for those of you who are finding your rest in Jesus, that that would continue and that you would be an example for others, that you would show others how to do that, that you'd realize it's one of our most powerful testimonies. Okay, so let me pray for you. Father God, I, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for this story. What just is a, a day trip for them, Lord, can be a life-changing story for us. Because it talks about trusting you. And Lord, we've all experienced storms in our life, and maybe some of us are experiencing it right now. And Lord, I know there may be some people in here that have never trusted you, ever. They're just here, but they've never really trusted you. They've never walked away from the promises of this world. And I pray, God, that if that if you would, you would move in your heart their hearts, Lord, and they would trust you for the first time right now. God, I pray for those who have already trusted you, but have kind of let the worries of the world creep back in, the promises of the world creep back in, Lord, and I pray that you would make make their hearts still right now and put their focus on you, God, not on the storm. Father, there are some that just really need to feel your presence right now through what they're going through. I pray, God, that you not be hiding from them, that you, you show them that you're there. You're there. They just hold on to you. And God, I pray for those who are resting in your promises. Even though stuff around them might be hard, they are resting in your promises. Lord, I pray that you would use that story, that example, to minister to others, God. Thank you for faith. Thank you for the ability to rest in you. And I pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 